Hello, everybody, and welcome to the channel. Today, I'm joined by Eric Hansen, who has been working on Blood and Crowns for Firelock Games. Uh, so it's great to have you with us today, Eric. Um, before we get into Blood and Crowns, um, I just thought it'd be nice to, to get to know a bit about the man himself. Uh, so have you been um, into wargaming long? and uh, dabbling in our little hobby uh first off thank you for having me on um this is fantastic um i've been doing it for a minute uh i cut my teeth i guess you could say of the first game i played was the red box uh dungeons and dragons back in the 80s mm -hmm. and then about mid 90s i picked up historical miniature gaming with a game called armadi second edition mm -hmm. um and then from then i kind of got all over the place with miniatures uh you know did a little sci-fi did a lot of fantasy with Warlord from Reaper. Uh, obviously played 40K. Um, I say obviously, but it seems like everybody touches or is aware of it. Yeah. But uh, uh, Battletech, um, Pig Wars uh, was another one we played quite a bit. Um, kind of all over the place, you know, yeah. a little bit of everything, uh, especially conventions and stuff. Um, I've probably run um, a little bit of RPG at conventions, uh, ran a multi-year D, D campaign, Pathfinder, that kind of thing. So I've kind of uh, been doing it for a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And is the historic side then um, one that that is high in the list? Because I, I tend to dabble in a lot of stuff. Uh, and even though weirdly I play a lot of fantasy, historics are probably my love, although I don't often get the chance to play them as much as I want. Absolutely. I, I fell in love. I started doing living history um, out of high school. And so I kind of like really just fell in love with history. And um, so they definitely, that's where I started. That's where my roots are as far as miniature gaming goes. And um, and medieval with the roots in D&D &D, and I was always kind of stuck in my head. Mm -hmm. So about, I would say seven, eight years ago, give or take a minute, I was pretty heavily invested. I am pretty heavily invested in miniature gaming or miniature building authorities uh, castle system. Right. So it kind of just been collecting and I, I put it out for eye candy now and again, but I said, you know what? I'm going to run a game with this. I, I paid all this money. I might as well use it. Sure. So I ran a historical game uh, with using line rampant actually, okay. um, which is a fantastic convention game, probably one of the best in my opinion out there. Um, and that's what kind of caught the attention of Mike and them. Cause I had known them at the, they come to a local convention uh, I met them. They came up like the first night their first Kickstarter was running. Mm -hmm. And so the, like we, that's how we kind of met them. And then I backed that Kickstarter. And then over the years, we kind of just all, they're there at the conventions. We all hang out. I got to know Rufus and Kai pretty well. Um, and so I would be, and I ran multiple medieval games because once I did it, I kind of like, you know what? I love this historical. And I kind of started setting the fantasy side a little bit. Yeah. And I started to run historical games and we did, and it kind of drove me into the research. And for whatever reason, I landed on the hundred years war period. Mm -hmm. And then I was, uh, you have a little just chatting with Mike at the convention. And um, that's kind of how the whole thing started. Uh, that conversation led to an invite to a uh, group for game design for Firelock, which then I kind of, in hindsight, I think he was tricking me a little bit. Cause he was kind of baiting the trap. And then yeah. I said, Hey, is anybody doing a hundred years war? <laughs> and then he's like, Nope, but they are now. And then and the then... door slammed shut. Exactly. So that's kind of how I fed into it. And at that point I, you know, and, and obviously I picked, really picked up my, this was right before COVID. So it was perfect mm. timing. If you want to do a miniature game, you know, yeah. um, but it did give me a lot of opportunity to do dig even further into the research and, and really kind of sink my teeth into the period. You know, so. Yeah. Well, um, that's one of the things that uh, particularly stands out with Firelock games is the attention to the historical accuracy um, when they they put out, whether it's the, the Blood and Steel or um, Blood and Valor or Blood and Plunder, they all uh, have a, a, a fairly in-depth look in some cases. Mm. Um, in some cases, extremely in depth, like with the end of empires, the the supplement for um, blood and valor, Kai and Rufus really went to town on all these little sort of interwar period um, factions that possibly a lot of people wouldn't have heard about, even if they were aware of things like the the Bolshevik Re revolution. They 
myriad of independent factions that crop mm. up in there is just mind blowing. Um, did it take a, a while to get into the the minutia of the the Hundred Years' War? Because it's a, a long conflict, longer than a hundred years, actually, if people haven't been paying attention, um, <laughs> and then having to to sort of refine that down or drill down into just specific aspects. So how long did that take? Oh, uh, it well. It took a while. And that's why I say it's kind of worked out nice that I had as much time as I did. Um, because the big one of the big helps I had, and I got to give him uh, the voiceover for the Kickstarter video is done by David Crowther of the History of England podcast. That kind he kind of like set the narrative for me and kind of created a nice little framework for me to build from capture names, places and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I, I started out of the gate. I went I, I went way too far. The the original faction list is is kind of absurd. And so what I ended up doing, and this is kind of it's interesting because some people have already kind of direct messaged me, kind of probing about this a little bit because where is I, X? Yeah. And so what I kind of have been explaining it is I decided to stick with more of our modern terminology, for lack of a better term, hmm. um, to kind of frame it out. And then let, because that's going to be very familiar to most people. Yeah. And then when you drill into the details, you'll see that I start to touch on the smaller factions. And plus, it kind of mirrors Blood and Plunder's faction list roughly. Mm. So it, there's a little bit of an analogy there, or, or it's a little analogous. So it's a little more consumable for people that are not familiar with the period. So, for example, like, you know, most people don't know what Gascony, like, get what's the significance of Gascony and Aquitaine. Sure. So they're under the French. Hmm. Even though you can, and then in the English list, you'll see like there's a, one of the units, I, I call it out as Gaskins Mm -hmm. to show that, you know, they're technically in the English list, but if you want to run a pure Gaskin force, you're going to use the French faction Yeah, because roughly speaking and, and, you know, with broader brushes is for all intents and purposes, the, the, the factions follow roughly a style of fighting. And that's kind of how I grouped them. So, you know, even though you have a lot of bleed over uh, with, I mean, it's, we're at the high middle ages. So it's, or the, uh, the, the, was, I guess, technically high is middle. Um, we're at the late medieval period. Mm. Everyone kind of figured out most of the equations at this point. So, and that's kind of then the interesting thing is where they differentiate is what I've, has been kind of the challenging part to capture because you got your English, you know, uh, and Welsh war bowmen, you've got your pikemen. And you've got like the Genoese uh, doing the, um, I forget what's called, like the Pivisieri, yeah. um, uh combined arms kind of thing, which I try to reflect in the game a little bit. So it kind of emphasizes those almost a little too much when you start reading the history because mm. they're so different. So I, balancing all that together. So that was a very long way of answering the question. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, 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 it's what I'm here for. It's what I'm asking them for. Um, <laughs> It's, there's nothing worse than going. Did that take you a while? And somebody going, yes. Next question. You know, that's <laughs> terrible. Um, because the, I mean, it's not a a period that I'm resoundingly familiar with. I I know the broad strokes of it. Uh, and when even if people were to go off and have a look at the the Hundred Years' War, just the Wikipedia page where you get the the list of belligerents, and it's just, you know it's it's as long as the page itself. And trying to reduce that down into something manageable for um people who don't know anything about the period uh is always going to be tricky and, and gripping like you say gripping together the various um kingdoms within france because they you know they work in a similar style and it, it makes it more manageable and it's a good step stepping off point um for mm. people who are just getting into historic gaming because i i feel that the the blood and games are are very good for that where you've got a, a relatively low model count um and it starts to introduce you to the concepts of of the period you're playing, uh, which is always nice. I am oh, huh, disappointed yeah. that the the Irish aren't going absolutely full pelt for the horizon, mind you. But you know, kind of everything. <laughs> they oh, I got it. Yeah, it that was one of the heartbreaking edits I made early on um, because I really them and the Welsh. I really wanted to include both more and with more teeth in it. The problem I was having is, or I am having, is that it's really hard to figure out the history of, of Ireland at that period. Oh, it's a, it's an absolute nightmare. We'll, we'll not get we'll not get distracted too much. But if people want to go and just just Google Morris Fitzgerald, um, 
Uh, and that shows the, the sort of madness that was going on in Ireland in, at the start of the Hundred Years' War. But it's interesting because even though there were Irish fighting on the English side, within Ireland itself, it gets very murky as to who was Irish and who was Anglo-Norman or Hiberno-Norman or any of that. Uh, and so there were a lot of Irish armies that went to fight against the French and against the Scots, mm -hmm. but they were more or less uh english living in ireland and then the the gales the irish at home or the the earlier norman factions who had started to develop into the the irish way of life mm -hmm. um sort of separated themselves and kept trying to use this as an excuse to take uh ireland back or become a new high king of ireland in their own right so yeah the the whole period every country i think Certainly the countries involved in this period in the, the Hundred Years' War, they were all learning their own sense of identity at this point. And mm. France, England, Ireland all developed into the nations that we know more or less today from the I think this is the first period where it's kind of defining where these countries were and who these countries are out of the, the smaller kingdoms that were within them to begin with which is one of the reasons why it's a, an interesting period to play around in. I completely agree. And and what's it, you're, and I think you see almost like their um their fortunes are almost tied to how closely they identify themselves with what we would call a national identity today mm -hmm. because this part, if the the English come out of the gate they're on the if you really look at the numbers it's like kind of like you know if Vegas is going to give you odds the odds for Edward when he crosses the channel with the Vegas odds would be terrible. Hmm. but and and i think it is overplayed a little bit because everybody says you know it's it's kind of broad brush that france is completely disunited disunited through the whole time yeah. and it's not they kind of come in and out and swerve and even england kind of does the same thing and compare it like they separate and they come scotland is a totally different animal altogether like i i northern scotland is the other one that i'm like we're gonna have to save that for later because that is really confusing sometimes i mean i got like the broad brushes but yeah. but exactly like your talk about like what i kind of picked up was interesting from ireland in ireland is that well, at least the uh, anglo ireland part is periodically a prince or high magnate will get stationed there hmm. and they essentially go there and then they like find an excuse to come back <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of a, a pattern through the whole period from the English perspective. It's like, I don't know what's happening over there. I don't know why you sent me over there, but I'm back. And I don't, please don't send me back. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, in, in some respects, and again, it, it comes back to why Scotland ended up allying with uh, France um, because the, uh, the amount of Flemish in Scotland uh, is massive. And mm -hmm. also a lot of the Normans who were granted lands in Scotland were Flemish Normans or, or allied to the Normans from, from uh, the Flemish lands because it had similar topography in some places. And, and there were things that needed to be done that required people who were familiar with dike building and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so the, the seeds from 1066 of the, the land ceded to the new Norman Lords helped develop the point that Scotland was more uh, connected to the the continent and to Flemish than to England and therefore helped push them towards France as well. It's a, I mean, you, you can, you can get lost in this. I oh think. yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And you, you realize how important a sheep is. Yeah. Like that was the one thing, like I realized like sheep is like super important <laughs> like, or so are super important to the history of Britain. And, and it's like one of those little things. It's like sheep and geese. Like, I don't know why. Like I like you, you realize those two animals are so tied, like you're saying, with the the tie to the the low countries with the cloth trade. Yeah. And you can like think I've just read a really interesting book, um, a real academic read on the Douglases. Mm. And one of the themes in there is the 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 rise and fall of the Douglases can almost be tracked with the the like the wool trade. And it when they yeah, and it's kind of fast. So when the wool trade starts dropping off and they don't have the income from the fighting on the marches, they start to lose their influence. Right. And it's, so it's a really fast, it's a, we could, man, we could probably go on, yeah, like yeah. you said, we could go down some rabbit holes, but. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll not even get into, um, I think it was David II and his his ideal to start a silk trade in or silk weaving in um, Scotland as well. 
which Ooh, is another at- reason that we tied back and forth. I noticed within the um, the factions then, so there are Scotland, uh, England, Wales, and Ireland are grouped together, France, the Spanish kingdoms, and then there are free companies and pirates. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, John Crabbe is in there. He was a, a possibly the most famous Scottish pirate ever. Um, so how big is how big is the unaligned, shall we say? Because obviously people will go England and France, that is the Hundred Years' War, and then other people sort of drop in and drop out and support them. But um, but what sort of what sort of thing will people find within the unaligned companies? I honestly think you're gonna the unaligned company. The only thing that's downside they do you have John Crab. Um, so they, they only have one legendary leader, hmm. but they have the most flexible list in the game. So like, for example, the free company, you can, there's now some, like, I think I have it right now is you can take, like, say some English archers mm-hmm. or English, but you can't take them with Genoese crossbowmen. So there is some little like tailoring going on in there, Sure, but it's probably the most flexible list, honestly. And um, like, I, it kind of has been kind of, I'm realizing everybody's like you were saying earlier, like, Hey, what about these guys aren't in the game? Can I run them? My answer is run a free company and just paint them how you want. And so I think you're going to see the 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 unaligned free company be pretty popular in the game, um, where you're going to get the people really latching onto the um, the national identities is going to be like some of the again more the other legendary leaders, and the English or, and our force of course is like the war bows. You can take a lot more of them, you know. So the free companies is a little limited, I think, with how many you can take, but you can mix in those. It's a way to tailor it. So yeah, that. Okay. It's going to be interesting. Crab's interesting because I have him set up. He can run a ship for any faction. Because as you know, I did. He jumped ship, pun intended. Yes, multiple times. <laughs> I think he was ended up. Uh, he finally was granted lands by the an English. I can't remember what king of England it was, but but there was some mischief going on at Berwick as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and he lost his fleet there. So yeah. He flim he flim flammed quite a lot, like the uh, like the Burgundians in that respect. You never be entirely certain what side they're going to turn up on. One hundred percent, and it's it's a little bit. It's he's one of those really frustrating characters because because he was lowborn. Hmm. There's not a lot on him, but you can pick up those elements. There's a certain tragic element to him hmm. too. So he's incredibly. I think his son was murdered or something so, like his that. Son was being held a hostage and was yeah. murdered. Yeah, to, whenever it's, whenever John wouldn't uh, toe the line. Mm-hmm. So to speak. So uh, the, yeah. there are a few other uh, legendary leaders then as well. Is it is it one per faction? Have you limited it, or are there going to be a, a few for some of the larger sort of uh, I, nations? France, France, Scotland, and England all have three. Okay. Um, Spanish kingdoms have two, and then the unlines have one. So that's but eleven or twelve. I don't know. Math's hard. Um, <laughs> Substantial anyway. Yeah, and and that was that was another one where I edited myself down pretty good <laughs> the, the original list was a lot longer and i'm sure there's going to be people like why didn't you include so and so and but i want to give i wanted to give a nice foundation and mm-hmm. i tried to spread it out so you kind of have like early mid and late war represented in each sure. list it's kind of you know but um but the, and then but it's hard i, I want to save some of it i guess point. i try to save something for the future and not go too crazy with the legendary leaders out of the gate. Yeah. Well, speaking of the the, the leaders, then um, I know the the game runs on the the sort of blood and plunder mechanics to a, a, mm-hmm. a large extent. Um, how has it changed? Because one of the things I seen was uh, sort of renowned and yielding, uh, and that idea of ransoming uh, captive leaders. Um, plays a, a big part in a lot of medieval warfare, anyway. But I, I see it's it's sort of written into the rules here. What what sort of mechanical uh, field can people find in the game then? So it's the biggest difference is passive armor. That was a big mechanics mechanic. I always forget. There's I know there's a huge debate whether it's a mechanic or mechanics or I don't. Anyway, mechanisms rule. <laughs> Uh, it was trying to balance that because, as you know, in blood and plunder, you if you're not in cover, it's the nine up for everybody. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest thing. I think it's going to throw a little people off. So you can, especially like with a man at arms unit or your retinue, you can cross some open ground. You might get scuffed up, but you can survive some pretty decent real estate crossing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably a big one. We also introduced, uh, I collaborated with Mike on this. And that's why I keep referring to myself as the game's developer, because this is very much rooted in 
Mike's original design. It's it's okay. a brilliant system. There's no reason to rock the ship too much. Mm -hmm. um, so I added, we worked, we collaborated and came up with a way to do fight backs. So, and this is kind of one of those rules that came up in a discussion. I think that it sounds on paper like it's going to be like super powerful for the defenders. Mm -hmm. But when you go into close combat, um, you're going to be able to take a, as a defender, take a fatigue to perform a fight back that happens simultaneously with your opponent's action. Okay. Sounds like you're really giving the defender um, a, a, an unfair advantage or kind of on paper. I think that's people's mm -hmm. concern. But once you factor in the fatigue gain, it, it plays fine on the table for one. Yeah. The other thing it kind of reflects in this is, is, you know, that medieval soften them up and charge thing still existed in this period, but you start to see a shift to the defender mm -hmm. defensive warfare, you know, but prior to this, roughly speaking, again, paying in huge broad brushes, yeah. um, the, you wanted to be super aggressive. You wanted to be the one to launch the cavalry charge. You wanted to be the first one to, to, to draw blood. But in this period, you start to see a shift to more defensive warfare. Mm -hmm. And you see this, especially in the big battles with the English. You know, the whole point is they, and that's kind of one of the things that gets missed. It's like at Cressy, Poitiers, and then everybody knows at Agincourt, there was a certain amount of terrain prepping. Yeah. So that lends itself very much to the success of the war bowmen. So there, and, and, and if you look, all three of those battles, big English victories were all them on the defensive posture and the French as the aggressors. So... That's kind of reflected in the rules that you got to make sure you soft your opponent up. If you charge a fresh unit, you're going to probably, you're going to get hit back. So that's a huge, that was a huge difference. Um, I'm trying to think of what some of the other, uh, the, the point scoring is a little different. I think with break points, you're kind of, it's a slightly more thematic change, mm -hmm. but in blood and plunder, you're kind of getting weakening. You're getting break points moving towards breaking. Well, in this, you're going to be trying to, all you're trying to do is get renown. So it's all kind of more of like a, you just want to do things to get renown. So, for example, I have a couple scenarios add some, but like the base, one of the base things you can do is if you break a unit on a charge, like wipe mm -hmm. them out completely, you get a renown for that. Okay. If it's same thing, you quarter the force, just like in Blood and Plunder, you get a renown. But like you pointed out, now you have the idea of the prize mixed in. So your leader, all leaders are prizes. And I think there's a couple characters that are prizes. If you capture a prize, it moves, you basically becomes like a marker. It goes to your unit and there'll be mm -hmm. some mark, like the, the, that's one of the markers actually on the punch out sheet. So you put that on the unit that captured. If the, uh, if you can destroy that unit in close combat, you can rescue the leader and get a renown. So you're kind of constantly walking that renown ladder up. And then when you exceed your opponent by so much renown, you, you roll to break and, mm -hmm. and take off. Okay. Um, on so top of this, you have the concept of no quarter, which is there wasn't really a period. So if you fly the Oriflom, for example, now the leaders are instantly killed okay. and you get the renown. You don't have to worry about protecting a prisoner. So there's kind of it's a neat dynamic. It's interesting yeah. to see because you get people that are drilled into wanting to get that leader. And some people are like, like they, it kind of adds that psychological dynamic. Do I protect my leader? He's my strongest unit. Do I commit him? When do I commit him? Yeah, it's been pretty fun. Yeah, I, I like that. I like the idea as well of the the attempt to rescue back captive leaders or captive heroes, whoever it happens to be, um, because then you've got to weigh up whether or not you want to all of a sudden have to potentially expend troops to go and chase uh, a unit that's holding hostages, um, whereas they may be better off. We'll pay the ransom after the fact. He's gone for us for this game good luck goodbye but we can do more damage we can win more renown on the other side of the table doing something else mm -hmm. uh, and potentially then um, going running after your lost leader uh, could potentially lose you the game rather than win it so the the, the focus can shift as well um, which adds interesting interesting permutations and dynamics to the game i like that yeah it's been fun to watch people the di that's kind of been the fun thing is like as I've produced or introduced this game to people and we've done play testing is watching the psychological part of it. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, another element of the game um, with, and I don't, I'm sure of one of the, uh, it's, it kind of was inspired by blood and valor. You know how you have like the grand maneuver? Yes. It's like a one shot. I'm going to do this and kind of, and it can be really critical if you do it at the right time. Yeah. So the English war bowmen for the English Welsh war bowmen, you're going to have an ability when you launch the arrow storm, 
it's a pretty powerful attack. You're going to get a, extra dice. You're going to have a resolve penalty. It's like you're dumping arrows. But after that point, your shooting is now reduced for the rest of the game. Because okay. it represents, you know, like, uh, for example, at Agincourt. Of all their... Right. And Shots. now they're light infantry. Yeah. And they can still shoot. But so there's that element of risk taking. Hmm. And hopefully, you know, my goal was to get the points balance. Because if you look at uh, capturing that flavor of the English in the period, especially like that, Eng- that, that there was constant risk taking. They were constantly okay. rolling the dice and they got lucky a lot, in this, at least for the first I'm not going to do the math for first while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it it but, was all going great until the 1400s yeah. arrived, and then not so much. Yeah, so yeah. Somebody got a little tummy ache uh, there in France and kind of, or in, that set everything back after that. His son wasn't exactly, let's say, a dynamic follow up yeah. there. But, uh, that's but, but um, waxing yeah. and waning fortunes of families. What can we say? Mm hmm. That's the biggest, those are the biggest differences. I think um, I did streamline the sea combat a little bit. Like you're not going to sink each other's ships directly. There's nothing at this period. There really wasn't anything you could sink a ship with other than fire. Yeah. So that's obviously in there. So I kind of took out some of those rules and and simplified the the sea battles, but it plays very similar to Blood Plunder. So you're still going to do, you know, the the three turns. I think it's like a three ship maneuvers per turn. Mm -hmm. And everything like that. Um, firing firing a ship is a little easier because they were tinder boxes back then. They, they, I guess they just. Um, but uh, so that stays pretty much the same. And I, the one downside, and I don't think anybody's going to have a problem with this per se. But I did not include um, uh, what's it called, amphibious landings. Okay. But all the rules are there if you want to run an amphibious game. It would just take way too long. I think in this, there's not enough shooting. So it'd just yeah. be like the first three turns would just be paddle, 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 paddle. paddle. Yeah, slowly moving <laughs> towards the beach. Yeah. Or, or marshy land, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, you're not gonna have cannon reaching out and touching anybody. So yeah. but but that being said, like I said, if you're doing a scenario at home, the rules are there. Um I put all the train rules for shore and everything. So you could do some some naval or some amphibious plus there was only one recorded battle I could find like that was on a beach. Mm-hmm. Um they just they were just too susceptible to the wind. They didn't. Nobody knew where anybody was going. They didn't know where they were going. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, but it, it wasn't the the, the finest shipbuilders uh, at that point doing the the, the best work. It was yeah. we make this box of wood float across the channel, and I hope <laughs> I hope we end up on a beach close to where we were going. So, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, have Have you got plans then for uh, future books? Because you you said you've there's a few things that you've held back or couldn't get included in this. Then there's the, the potential to do like a end of empire style book where you, you really sort of drill in and, and deep dive into specific um, areas here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if this continues to evolve um, probably the biggest two missing elements in the core book, um, were going to be siege battles mm-hmm. and gunpowder and gunpowder. Uh, I actually just answered a question on the Kickstarter this morning about this. Um, gunpowder is tricky in this period. Because it it's mentioned at Cressy, so we know that say roughly mid 14th century, it's gonna it evolves through the whole period to and actually it's like kind of a real extreme difference because it goes from eh, yeah we heard some booming and saw some smoke to it wins the Battle of Castellon. Yeah, <laughs> like so I couldn't I couldn't find a really comfortable way to um, kind of capture that in the core rules. Sure. So that's one of the big things I want to handle. And then, and that kind of ties somewhat into um, uh, the siege battles a little bit, because that's mm-hmm. where they kind of seem to appear the most, you know, especially like at Harfleur and stuff. Their rate of fire was dismal. That's another thing, another challenge. So that's kind of a big rules mechanic things I want to handle. Yeah. And with the siege battles, it wouldn't be like massive attacking a wall. I want to just, I have some, the framework of these rules are in my mind and my head. But to do like zoomed in stuff, like the final escalade, breaking through a breach. Um, I have an idea how to potentially do some mind fighting. We'll have to see. Maybe that'll be like a side game within a game because that was apparently like really a big deal. Yeah. Like they like if you like, in fact, it's mentioned that Henry V got like some serious kudos from his men because he went down into a mine and fought. So it was considered a very uh, prowess thing or whatever, like a big feather in your cap. Um but all that kind of ties directly, especially the gunpowder, into like doing like the War of the Roses. Hmm. So I have a tentative agreement with Mike that I'm not going to cross 1492. 
Yes. And I don't see the rules going deep into the 13th century. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I did the armor, if anybody's at home, this has been another big, everyone wants me to go deep into like the, the uh, Baron's War. People keep asking that. Just don't, there's a special rule for plate. I think I called it plate and mail and full harness mm-hmm. to up the armor and uh, resilience of your men at arms units. Just exclude those rules and you pretty much can run early 13th century because that's the other thing too is everyone kind of has a visual thing in their head of what the, the is is much later it's more yeah. 15th century and part of that is because if you go to any museum like i went to the uh musée de l'armée last summer and i remember i'm walking through and it kind of doesn't ba- i well i went the wrong way so that's probably a problem so i went the left when you should have gone straight and okay. so i was doing it in descending order uh-huh. and so you started in the 16th century and I'm going down and, and you're just seeing gobs of stuff. And like you get into like the War of the Roses, you see the Salets, Salets, I don't know. Somebody in the comments will tell me I'm saying it wrong. Um, and uh, you just see gobs of them. And then you yeah. walk into this one room and it's like 14th century and there's one cabinet. Yeah. And then one of them isn't even there because they had to lend it to another museum, like one suit of armor. I'm like, so the bio, so I think a lot of people's visual thinking of this period is very much rooted in the 15th century. Mm. So what they don't like, you kind of forget that like at um, uh, in the early 14th century, I mean, you're still mostly wearing chain mail. They're slapping there. You know, now we're getting a breastplate. We're getting some plate here and there, but there's a lot of chain mail. And then you go all the way to uh, the end of the war, Castellan there. You're wearing the steel gorgets, gorget, mm-hmm. gorgets, gor- I, you know, uh, um, and you're almost, and you got the overlapping plates and all the full articulation and stuff like that. So that's a pretty significant difference in technology yeah. and that was another challenge of trying to make that feel right but it's like i say in my little i i stole a uh from uh blood and steel and i did like kind of a here's from the author type thing like mm-hmm. you know then i and i mentioned there it's like i had to keep reminding myself this is a game as long as it feels right and it's fun that's the most important part you know yeah. because it's it's hard to get some of this stuff Unless you do a simulation, it's very hard to capture some of those elements, sure. like that disparity in armor and stuff. I mean, when you look at things like the Gallo glass, um, they more or less stayed the same from the 8th century through to almost the 16th century. I'm not saying that as as Irish are resistant to change or anything, but uh, if a conical helm with a nasal garden chainmail coast down to your knees was good enough for great 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 granddad then i'm going to keep on swinging that axe with this so yeah the, people have this idea that it's the um the yankee uh king arthur's court style everybody was wearing full plate all the time and everybody mm-hmm. was super shiny and it's it's such a, a small part towards the the end whenever that started to develop and and that style of armor didn't last particularly long because by the time they'd really hit that form and function gunpowder was on the rise at mm-hmm. which point then people realized that we're wearing an awful lot of extra armor not getting any real physical protection against these little bits of shot that are moving at pace so mm-hmm. yeah the i think the uh hollywood has ruined armor for us i think that's how it goes yeah it's, it's i was just yeah talking to, with obviously people about this all the time and and it's like brave hearts kind of my my heartbreaking moment because as a kid i loved that movie yes i mean i was just i watched it over and over and over and it just captured my ma- and i give it still credit it captured my imagination but then you then you read the history yeah yeah there's a there's a world of difference between those <laughs> yeah like you said where's the bridge <laughs> this yeah. is battle of sterling bridge without the bridge and then it's like okay and then you just kind of go down from there but like I said, you know, it inspired me, so I'll I'll take it for what it is there. Well, inspiration comes in all forms, and hopefully mm. uh, this little chat will have inspired some people to go and check out the Blood and Crowns Kickstarter, uh, which is running for the rest of this month. Uh, it's been an absolute joy speaking with you, Eric, and uh, hopefully we'll do this again soon and maybe explore some other periods as well. That would be a lot of fun, I feel. Absolutely. I really appreciate everyone. You have me on and everyone, please, uh, please check out the Kickstarter. And I just, I have to say thank you to, you know, uh, Lily for the, just the absolute absurdly wonderful artwork. Uh, Daniel for the sculpts he's doing is it, it, he's, it's just, it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to see that side of the hobby and have advice and be able to guide, you know, um, how some of these projects go. So, and then of course, everybody at Firelock, those, they're amazing. 
They're absolutely amazing. And I can tell you, they're listening to everything everybody's saying. I'm not allowed to reveal a lot because I mainly because I don't know a lot. Um, <laughs> but I know that there I, I have these brief conversations or text messages and I'll get questions from Mike and uh, or Alex. And 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 so just a huge thank you to them for their support and uh, encouragement and faith in me doing this. So, yeah. There we go, folks. Uh, if you've any questions about Blood and Crown, please drop them down below. We'll pass them across to Eric and the guys at Firelock. Uh, and uh, like we say, go and check out the Kickstarter. Until next time, bye-bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.